Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this month's Dean's Research Seminar. Um, before we get going, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I am on today, the Boon people of the Kulin Nation, as well as the traditional owners of the land you're situated on. I acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge in our academy and acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have been custodians of the lands and waterways of Australia for thousands of years. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Today, Professor Andrew Fisher from Melbourne Veterinary School will present his Dean's Research Seminar on improving the welfare of young calves, research on welfare implications of feeding, transport and surgical husbandry practices. Professor Fisher earned his Bachelor of Veterinary Sciences with honours in 1989 here at the University of Melbourne. He then worked as a private practitioner in mixed practices in Australia and in Northern England, and for four years in Ireland, where he worked on improving beef cattle welfare while completing his PhD at University College Dublin. After that, he worked in agricultural research in New Zealand for six years and returned to Australia in 2002 to lead the CSIRO Livestock Welfare Research Group. Andrew joined the University of Melbourne in 2009 and in 2011 was appointed the Chair of Cattle and Sheep Production Medicine. In his time in the faculty, he's held leadership roles, including Associate Dean for Research and Research Training, Veterinary Clinical Sciences Department Head and Director of the Animal Welfare Science Centre, and he's currently Service Head of Production Animals. His research focuses on welfare and farm animal production and the management and health of cattle and sheep. Andrew has over 100 peer-reviewed journal publications. He was appointed one of the first two fellows in animal welfare at the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists in 2010. And in 2011, he became a member of and then the chair of the OIE Working Group establishing beef cattle welfare standards. Today, we'll hear about Andrew's research on the welfare of young dairy calves. Andrew, welcome and over to you. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this Dean's Research Seminar. I will um, now endeavour to uh, share my screen. All right, so um, in order to get started, uh, by way of introduction, a lot of this uh, seminar focuses on uh, dairy calves. Uh, there's a little bit about beef calves, but there's a lot about dairy calves. And calves born in th into the dairy industry are, are somewhat unique in the sense that we don't uh, typically rely on their mothers to rear them, but typically calves in the dairy industry are removed from their dams uh, at about um, 12 to 24 hours of age, and, uh, and they're, they're reared by us, by humans. And this creates both responsibilities in terms of we're now you know, in loco parentis, but also challenges in terms of you know, good management and welfare. And we're going to talk about some of those in this seminar. Um, and Along with others, I have uh, been involved in research over the past few years on a range of issues. Uh, these include the welfare of bobby calves. Uh, bobby calves are young dairy calves that leave the farm at an early age, often into the meat supply chain. Uh, so we've done work on the welfare of bobby calves, uh, looking at uh, how frequently and how much dairy calves should be fed. Uh, what are some strategies for actually trying to maintain uh, calves with their mothers for a slightly longer period of time in the dairy farm. And then a little bit around surgical husky practices, specifically uh, disbudding to prevent future horn growth, and also the timing of castration for male calves that may um, be involved in the, in the beef industry thereafter. And so I want to present some of the results and implications of this work in this seminar. And I want to really do some key credits uh, right at the front. There'll be some general acknowledgements at the end, but really, uh, I really need to acknowledge right up front that this work is very much based on uh, research that has been undertaken as part of uh, PhDs and master's projects, specifically Natalie Roadnight, who has recently submitted her PhD on um, bobby calf welfare and cow calf um, management. Uh, in the dairy industry, and also Gabriella Marquette, who undertook her MPhil on the disbudding and castration welfare research. And um, Gabby actually 
uh, is an animal science uh, graduate from Brazil, and she uh, came to uh, Australia briefly, and then she got to actually uh, the bulk of her research being based in Ireland as a collaboration we have with um, Chogask, uh, the Irish Government Agricultural Research Agency. Um, the other thing I should say is that uh, Dr. Ellen Youngman, my colleague in the Animal Welfare Science Centre, uh, led, uh, led the calf feeding work. And uh, colleagues Peter Mansell, Natalie Cortman, Kelly Stanger, also co-supervised our HD students. I want to acknowledge uh, collaborators, particularly uh, Dr. Bill Wales from Agriculture Victoria, uh, Bernadette Early and Mark McGee from Chogask, and the funding agencies that have uh, helped to uh, us to undertake this work. That includes Meat and Livestock Australia, uh, Lactalis, a dairy company, uh, Dairy Australia, and Chogask in Ireland. So the first piece of work that I want to talk about is uh, on the welfare of bobby calves in the supply chain. And why I say in the supply chain, because what we have with bobby calves is quite young calves, typically between five and 10 days of age, and they then undergo transport um, to an abattoir. And so there's issues around transport, there's issues around handling that need to be managed well. And also these are young animals that used to um, being milk fed and they obviously go for a period of time without being fed as part of that um, transport and marriage process. And that can create challenges and concerns for their welfare. Uh, these animals have uh, low body fat reserves in terms of energy reserves. They also have little or no flight zone. And so unlike us being able to kind of herd animals onto a truck or herd them down a raceway because they move away from us, um, these young dairy calves typically don't move. And so sometimes they need to be kind of physically um, moved. And that creates both human and animal challenges. Um, they also have a, an immature immune system being so young. And because um, cattle are dependent on colostrum for the transfer of maternal antibodies, um, we're dependent on that being done well or having been happened at the farm. And some of them uh, may have poor colostral transfer of immunity for various reasons. So because of the young age of their anim these animals and their vulnerability, there are um, concerns both in the public, but also within the industry itself about um, ensuring their welfare. There are some protections for these calves. So um, the standards for their management require that they must be fed within six hours of the pickup time from the farm. They must be transported for no more than 12 hours. And the industry has its own standard. It's not a legal one, but it has its own standard of a total time off feed, so off milk effectively, of no more than 30 hours before these animals are either fed or, or slaughtered at an abattoir. So we'd previously done research under controlled experimental conditions, looking at time off feed for bobby calves. And it was you know, within a, a controlled sample of calves that we transported and then measured. And uh, it was another you know, true commercial conditions, but it identified that there was a risk, particularly as that 30 hour mark was approached, uh, that um, some calves may become hypoglycemic. So this is work that uh, I did with Peter Mansell uh, some years ago, but it was a controlled study. And we felt that it was important to actually capture what's happening out there in commercial reality. And so this is um, very much part of Natalie Roadnight's PhD. And the aim is to actually determine the welfare state of a representative sample of bobby calves uh, at Victorian abattoirs under truly commercial conditions. And beyond that, we wanted to test for relationships between both the distance travelled by the calves and the time in transit and changes in their blood biochemistry, indicative of what we saw as the three key risks to their welfare. That is um, energy status, so the risk of energy depletion, uh, hydration, so the risk of dehydration, and also muscle fatigue or muscle damage from the transport process. And we also measured... Uh, their colostral immune status, as well as a check on how that was going. So how was this done? Uh, effectively, blood was collected at slaughter or immediately post-slaughter um, at the abattoir. Uh, this was done in this way because it was um, very quick and easy. 
Uh, it enabled us to sample large numbers of calves, but also sample calves right at the end of this period of, of fasting. So at the, you know, the maximum uh, point of, um, of their feed deprivation, if you like. Uh, and you can see there was a considerable number of bobby calves uh, sampled uh, from three Victorian abattoirs, which um, sort of uh, uh, processed calves from different areas of the state and a little bit of calves that came from interstate and uh, across two seasons, spring and autumn calf seasons. And we analysed samples, as I said, based on looking for indicators of hydration status, um, energy and metabolic status. You can see blood glucose there was the key thing we measured, and uh, muscle fatigue or damage. And there's an enzyme called creatine kinase that effectively leaks into the bloodstream from uh, uh, damaged uh, muscle cells. And so we measured that. And as I said, we also uh, measured uh, the, the extent of or the prevalence of the failure of passive transfer of immunity via colostrum uh, from the cows. And the other thing that we're able to do, because bobby calves are required by law to have an NLIS tag in the ear, and that tag actually gets scanned as um, calves um, board a transport vehicle and also um, when they arrive at an abattoir, and obviously we could um, scan that tag um, immediately post-slaughter. And that data uh, is um, held by um, the Victorian Department of Agriculture, and we were able to access that in a de-identified uh, way um, to estimate our distance transported from the farm of origin and also the, the actual time in transit. And that was really useful, of course. Uh, some broad descriptive data to start with. Um, the farms, the calves that we measured came from a bit over a thousand farms. That meant obviously that there were um, a number of farms with more than one calf in the data set. And that allowed us to look at farm effects a little bit. Um, interestingly, although it's assumed that the vast majority of bobby calves are male dairy calves, male dairy calves, it's hard to grow them up for beef. Um, there was just, if you noticed in the media yesterday, uh, an article, I think, on The Age online uh, or ABC about um, a new initiative to try and grow male dairy calves up for beef. But it, it's hard for them to put on enough muscle in the same time frame as a beef animal. Uh, so typically, that's why a lot of these male dairy calves are consigned to the abattoir at an early age. But interestingly, we did find 11% of the um, calves uh, were female. Um, the breed mix probably reflected uh, the broader breed mix uh, in Australian dairying. And the vast majority of uh, calves had their farm of origin in Victoria, but we did have some calves that had travelled down from New South Wales and a very small number across from uh, southeastern South Australia. If we get into the, um, the welfare results, there were a proportion of calves, and it was a minority uh, in, in, in each case, that showed some evidence of compromised welfare. So in terms of um, dehydration, uh, and it wasn't necessarily severe de dehydration, but you know, clinical mild dehydration was present in about 11% of calves. Um, low blood glucose uh, was present in about 2% of calves. Um, increased creatinine kinase is an indicator of muscle fatigue or damage, about 36% of calves. This is not uncommon for any cattle that have been transported, um, just because increased muscle exertion or a few knocks can very rapidly increase creatinine kinase. So that's a, a not uncommon result for transport studies. Um, but yeah, it was present. And uh, around 35% of calves showed um, effective failure of passive transfer of colostral immunity. Uh, and that is that is obviously in one sense a problem because it shows that they haven't got that. For these calves, their life because was relatively short, so they probably uh, didn't have much time to develop infectious disease, but it does show that you know, there are, those animals were at increased risk of um, infectious disease. Um, previous studies on uh, failure of passive transfer in dairy calves have shown that uh, a study by Zoe Vogels about 15 years ago uh, down at Timboon suggested that 38% of heifer calves in that survey had failure of passive immunity. But when uh, we, through Natalie's PhD, undertook a reference range study 
on the Victorian dairy farms more recently, and that study found 7% of calves with failure of passive transfer. So um, it, it may be that these bobby calves had failure of passive transfer, perhaps a bit above what's currently um, practice for um, the calves that get retained on dairy farms. But the interesting thing, and perhaps an important thing about this failure of passive transfer was that there was a strong farm of origin effect. So um, there were about 81 farms where there were um, um, at least uh, 15 calves coming from the one farm across our data set. And so when we looked at this in terms of um, whether they had adequate um, indicator of uh, maternal immunity or failure of passive transfer of maternal immunity, we can see that there is um, quite a strong effect. So the, the um, open part of the bar is um, the number of calves that had um, adequate maternal immunity and the dark part of the bar is um, calves that had in sufficient maternal immunity. And um, it's, each bar is a farm. And we can see that within each um, grouping, and they're grouped by the number of calves we had sampled per particular farm, we can see that there's a wide variation. Some farms appear to manage it pretty well with very few um, calves in the dark bar portion, and others um, have a majority of calves. Uh, with failure of passive transfer. And that suggested to us that it is possible to manage this well, and there is a strong farm management effect in this data set. Um, there wasn't a strong effect of time in transit, uh, but there was a strong distance effect. Um, so with increasing distance traveled from the farm of origin, um, hematocrit, that's the um, indicator of um, dehydration in terms of the proportion of red blood cells as a proportion of the total blood volume, a hematocrit increased, um, blood glucose decreased, and interestingly, creatinine kinase decreased. Um, that one is a little bit counterintuitive, uh, but we think it's because most uh, sort of uh, muscle uh, damage may actually occur during loading and the initial stage of a journey through knocks or so forth. And that um, as the journey continues, um, that creatinine kinase value naturally resolves. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, longer distances actually had reduced creatinine kinase. Um, interestingly, all were clinically fairly small effects. So although they were statistically significant, um, distance didn't have a, on average, a huge clinical impact on, for example, dehydration or um, reductions in blood glucose. And I'll just show you a, a graph here. So this um, graph presents um, blood glucose on the y-axis and distance travelled up to um, 1,000 kilometres uh, on the x-axis. And each, um, each data point is a calf. And what we can see is that um, both the red linear trend line and the blue uh, fitted um, sort of uh, non-linear trend line suggests that Although there is a, a slight effect, uh, the linear trend line suggested that there's um, a reduction of 0.05 millimoles of glucose uh, per every 100 kilometres travelled. It is overall a very small effect, even though we could statistically detect it. So the conclusions from this work, and you can see the, the reference to the published paper below, was that a relatively small percentage of calves showed evidence of significantly compromised welfare. Um, a main concern was that 35% of these calves did show failure of passive transfer of immunity, but there was wide variation between farms. Increasing travel distance did cause greater welfare effects, but the effect was small. Um, one limitation of this data set is because we sampled calves at the point of slaughter. Um, we didn't include in the data set or we were unable to include, and it is quite difficult to source the data on calves that may have died during transport or were euthanized in, in layerage. Uh, and so that would be a perhaps important follow-up. Um, we have tried to do that, but there are some difficulties in obtaining that data. Overall, the results suggested that things are not disastrous in commercial reality and that the transport process itself may be uh, reasonably managed, but 
the preparation of calves on the farm of origin may be variable and may be an important factor in their welfare uh, following their departure from the farm. The next piece of work that I want to talk about is work that was led by my colleague, um, Dr. Ellen Youngman, on calf milk feeding frequency and volume on the farm, whether these are the bobby calves that subsequently leave or whether these are uh, heifer calves that get retained. Now, uh, in Australian dairying and internationally, the traditional thinking about uh, feeding calves milk on farm was that um, if we fed them more milk, that would mean that they would um, eat less hard feed as they're sort of starting out. That would reduce the rate of rumen function and development, and that therefore it was thought the best option was to not feed them too much milk. And the recommendation up to recently has been feeding around 10% of a calf's body weight in milk daily. So if a 50 kilogram calf, it would receive uh, five litres of milk daily. Uh, and that by limiting the milk consumption in that way, it would lead the calf to eat more concentrates and more quickly be able to be successfully weaned. Now, those recommendations have changed recently and it's based on data not so much collected by us, but broadly, uh, both Australia and very much internationally, that suggests that um, lifetime productivity gains of the future dairy cow are gained by feeding calves uh, more milk and making sure their nutrition is better all the way through in their um, first couple of years of life. And it's been found, for example, that bigger heifers are generally more productive in their first and subsequent lactations and tend to uh, calve more easily and get back in calf more easily afterwards. So this has led to the current recommendations, including here in Australia, that uh, effectively doubled the milk feeding to calves. That is 20% um, of body weight daily in terms of milk feeding. Now, interestingly, uh, these uh, recommendations have been very much based on productivity and, and production. And there's nothing, uh, nothing wrong with um, productivity and future production is what drives an industry, what helps keep farmers in business. But we were interested in uh, what is the calf's perception of this um, change and uh, the calf's uh, benefits to its well-being from also increasing the feeding rate. So in this study, the aim is in quite young dairy calves. We're focused on three to eight days of age because we're also interested in making this recommendation for the bobby calves that leave the farm afterwards. Uh, to compare the effects of milk feeding levels of 10% or 20% of body weight daily, but also look at um, the effects of once daily versus twice daily feeding. Because of course, it is more convenient for a farm to feed the calves once daily, unless they have an automated system. Uh, but in terms of what naturally occurs for calves, um, twice daily feeding may be um, you know, more reflective of the more frequent feeding that they may undertake um, in, in natural conditions. And uh, the study measured uh, blood metabolic indicators, but most particularly uh, behaviours of the calves. Uh, so essentially, uh, there were um, three treatments. Um, so one group of calves had the traditional um, feeding of 10% of body weight uh, offered daily as one feed. Uh, another group of calves had 10% of body weight fed, but this was split over two meals, so 5% and 5% uh, morning and evening. And then a third group of calves uh, had 20% of body weight uh, offered over two meals, so 10% to 10%. Now, some of you may be wondering why we didn't have it as a fourth treatment of the 20% um, as a single meal. And the reason for that is it's actually quite um, hard and can be uh, not ideal for calves to consume that much milk all in one meal. So um, we actually, particularly for such young calves, so we actually needed to have just three treatments there. So we were able to compare once daily versus twice daily feeding at the 10% level and also compare 10% versus 20%. In terms of sort of basic indicators, um, unsurprisingly, uh, but it's good to always double check these things, um, calves fed at 20% body weight um, actually drank a higher milk, milk intake and uh, had um, higher weight gains. Um, milk intake on 
the very start of the study, when the calves were at their youngest in the research, was lower for calves fed once daily compared with calves fed twice daily. So even at that um, 10% daily allocation, there were benefits in terms of the calves being able to consume that amount in splitting it across two feeds. Uh, and we can see that we can see that effect there. The, the green feed is 20% um, body weight split into two feeds. Uh, the red line is 10% split into two feeds. And the blue line is 10% just in one feed. And you can see it took a couple of days for those calves to actually be able to achieve their full milk intake uh, when it was offered all at once. In terms of behaviour, um, the behaviour of non-nutritive sucking, which is where calves um, suck on things without actually getting milk, um, was mainly associated around feeding time, uh, typically just before feeding time or just afterwards. And it was highest in the calves that were fed 10% um, body weight over two meals. Um, and comparing that with the 20% calf group, the pattern of non-nutritive sucking suggested that um, these calves were still motivated to feed and were hungry. Um, we also found that um, play behaviour was reduced in calves fed once daily. Um, play in animals, in young animals, can be a useful indicator of their um, state of well-being and state of mind. And um, in calves fed once daily, they uh, exhibited less play behaviour uh, than uh, the 10% calves fed twice daily or the 20% calves. So um, broadly, the conclusions from this work was that um, feeding twice daily offered benefits in calves up to day four of life. Um, even at the 10% feeding level. Um, but overall, feeding 20% of body weight was certainly beneficial um, thereafter to increase you know, uh, growth, but also in terms of calf um, satisfaction of that feeding motivation uh, and, and uh, you know, um, increasing things like play. I haven't talked about um, metabolic variables, um, but essentially... Um, you know, they were all within normal physiological range, so that was fine. But certainly the behaviour would suggest that there were benefits in terms of satisfaction of calf hunger and increase in calf play of um, a 20% uh, feed allocation uh, split over two feeds. And you can see the published paper there. The next study I want to talk about is looking at the issue of is it feasible and practicable to extend the period of cow-calf contact on dairy farms. As I said earlier, uh, typically dairy cows and their calves are separated within the first 12 or 24 hours. Calves are then reared in the calf shed and cows join the milking herd. And this is done for ease of management, uh, maximising the amount of uh, milk that goes into the vat uh, and also um, biosecurity reasons. There are concerns about the transfer of the disease organism, uh, the d organism that causes Yoni's disease uh, from the cow to the calf. And so um, that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, early cow-calf separation is practised and indeed has uh, you know, traditionally been recommended on dairy farms and is by far uh, what's uh, typically done. I'm just going to have to move our cat a little bit so I can change the slides. Now, uh, recent systematic reviews in Canada uh, have questioned the necessity of early uh, cow-calf separation. And um, it's certainly also a degree of uh, contention and potential and negative public perception for the dairy industry. I'm not sure that too much of the public uh, are generally aware of the practice, but certainly um, you know, um, animal uh, advocacy groups, animal activist groups, who um, don't like the dairy industry um, are starting to use it as a, uh, a means of criticising the dairy industry and seeking to gain uh, public concern uh, around the practice. Uh, so there's an example there. Now, if uh, Australian dairy farms want to achieve a greater period of cow-calf togetherness as part of their system, it's actually more challenging than, in, for example, in North America, where um, you know uh, dairy cows are typically in a more confinement-based system 
with um, you know, a total mixed ration fed. And that's because in a, a more confined system, it's easier to kind of have the calves nearby and to uh, separate them off uh, and so forth. Whereas, you know, we operate a pasture-based system. Um, the cows have to uh, walk distances twice a day to and from the paddock. Um, you know, uh, typically young calves in particular wouldn't necessarily be walking those distances under natural conditions. Um, and it's then harder amongst that large group of cows to try to um, separate off the calves twice a day. So, so there are challenges around that at commercial scale in pasture-based dairying, even if someone wanted to do it. So um, the aim of this study was to actually look at uh, a way of perhaps seeing if there's a halfway house in uh, commercial uh, practical uh, pasture-based dairying that could be manageable. And so we aim to look at comparing the separation of cows and calves in milking only. That is how it would normally be done, uh, where the calf remains with the cow all the time, apart from when the cow goes through the milking shed. Uh, with what we might term a halfway house, whereby um, the calf is separated from the cow for the period of time between morning and afternoon milking. Okay, so that would limit the number of times in a day that you have to draft off the calves. It would limit um, how far the calves have to walk. So you can imagine that you might have like an overnight paddock that is closer to the dairy where the calves and cows walk back to after afternoon milking. Uh, but during the day, the calves are kept separately and the cows walk back to a slightly further paddock before coming back for afternoon milking. And we decided to compare these two systems on the belief that the second system, the half-day separation, may provide a more practicable op option if uh, a dairy farmer wishes to undertake something like this in commercial practice. Uh, it's a relatively small study because it needed to be focused very much on cow and calf behaviour. And although I said, um, the rationale for this was to examine a system that may be practicable in implementation under pasture-based dairying. Uh, just for reasons of doability in the study, we actually did it under a confinement system. Um, we felt that ought not to change the cow-calf relationship and the behaviours, um, but it made it manageable from a research perspective. Uh, so we applied uh, these two treatments for 11 days. So it's really looking at you know, uh, trying to extend out the cow-calf togetherness, but within a reasonably limited time frame as well. And uh, there was a big focus on capture of animal behaviour. So this study was part of Natalie Roadnight's PhD. You can see the video observation system there. There were 15-minute um, continuous observation periods uh, at strategic times during the day. And we also undertook additional measurements. So we looked at um, cow restlessness or otherwise during milking, what's called the flinch, step or kick response when the cows are being milked. We also looked at milk cortisol concentrations. Cortisol is a hormone that is increased by a number of things, including animal stress levels, and we can measure it in the milk. And although the study was not designed to, in terms of animal numbers, to look at these things, it was important to cover off on things like cow milk yield and calf weight gain. So these are some of the key results. In terms of um, suckling behaviour, the half-day separated calves, that's HD, the half-day separated calves suckled significantly more than the milking only separated calves before morning milking and after evening milking. So they appeared to both anticipate the forthcoming separation and also to try and make up for it um, once, they were, um, once they were reunited. Um, the challenge around that is when they were trying to suckle more after evening milking, that is, of course, occurring just after those cows have been milked and may have relatively little milk left in their udder at that moment. In terms of lying behaviour, there were some uh, differences in lying behaviour, probably driven by the fact that the, um, the uh, half-day separation calves are more uh, restless and trying to feed after evening milking. Um, there was increasing, interestingly, uh, some more play behaviour, though, in the half-day separation calves. And um, all calves um, 
gained weight very, very well, uh, which calves typically do, especially if left with their, their cows. Um, in terms of the cow behaviour, um, when returned to their calves after evening milking, the half-day separation calves uh, involved, did more grooming behaviour, uh, avoided nursing more than the milking only cows, and performed agonistic, that's um, uh, more aggressive behaviours, more than the uh, milking only separation cows. So it appears that uh, the half-day separation cows, in one sense, were pleased to be reunited with their uh, calves in terms of grooming behaviour, but found the um, desire of their calves to suckle um, a little bit problematic. Um, and the other thing we observed in the half-day separation cows was they were a little bit more restless during milking. So they performed uh, more kicks during milking than the milking-only separated cows. And also that was more um, obvious at evening milking compared with morning milking. But in general, there were no differences in cows in terms of ruminating time, uh, hour ease in separating the cows from the calves, um, cow vocalisations during separation, uh, milk cortisol or daily milk yield. So our conclusions from this piece of work was there are some uh, potential issues with a half-day cow-calf separation strategy compared with separation for milking only to do with um, calf hunger uh, that builds up during the, the separation and the calves wanting to feed upon reuniting and a bit of sort of cow discomfort around that given that they're being reunited with uh, hungry calves just after having been milked themselves and some degree of cow restlessness, particularly at evening milking. Now, it may be possible to um, uh, address the uh, calf satiety issue, perhaps by giving those calves a little bit of milk during the day uh, through a you know, teat feeding system, for example. Uh, so, yeah, perhaps some more work to be done, but uh, certainly suggests that uh, such an approach may be feasible, perhaps with a little bit more research around addressing that um, strong desire of the calves to feed um, when they're reunited with their dams after evening milking. Um, I now want to finish with two short studies uh, where we looked at both a uh, disbudding to prevent horn growth and also castration. These are considered important and valuable where they occur as surgical husbandry practices, but obviously they can have implications for calf welfare. And these last two studies form part of um, Gabriella Marquette's MPhil thesis. So, firstly, a uh, disbudding. Um, some cattle are born with the pole gene, which means that they are polled, they're naturally polled, and therefore they don't grow horns. Uh, that's very convenient. Uh, but certainly, most of our Holstein Frisian uh, sires that are used in dairying uh, are not naturally polled. And so um, the majority, the vast majority of our dairy calves need to be disbudded. That is the removal of the horn bud before it starts growing the horn in order to prevent future horn growth. And uh, for beef cattle, it, it varies a little bit, which are polled and which are horned. But certainly in Ireland, where Gabby did her field work, uh, a lot of the beef breeds are also naturally, um, naturally horned. So you can see here a photo of uh, a horn bud and a diagram. And you can see that um, the amount of tissue that needs to be removed, uh, normally through thermal cautery, um, is there. And that needs to be ideally removed before it grows too large, starts growing the horn, and before it starts to connect physically with the underlying bone of the skull. So current advice, uh, for example, in dairy calves, is that disbudding should be done around two to six weeks of age. Um, in general, it's also easier for us to disbud dairy calves than beef calves because we've got the dairy calves right there in the shed. Uh, whereas beef calves are typically with their mothers, they may be at pasture, we've got to bring them all in and separate out the calves and do it. So it is a little bit more difficult. And so particularly in Ireland, um, farmers tend to uh, leave the disbudding of the beef calves a bit longer. 
for those management reasons. So the aim of this study was actually to look at the effect of age, breed, and sex of calf on hornbud size of dairy and beef calves. And that's because um, although the beef farmers, for practical reasons, want to try and leave it a bit longer uh, to bring them in um, or wait till all the cows have calved, um, we want to make sure that they're not ending up doing it when that horn bud is too big to be effectively uh, treated with thermal cautery or, for example, it started to, to got to the size where it might be fused with the underlying bone. So um, a number of calves of different breeds and in the case of the beef animals, different sex, were uh, measured at different times of uh, disbudding. So uh, there were three beef breeds, Charolais, Limousin and Simmental, and the dairy animals, which were all male because um, that were the animals that we were able to get uh, from the dairy farms. Uh, and you can see that um, both the, uh, the calipers were used for both diameter and height of, of the hornbud. Uh, and one of the challenges actually in the beef breeds is that when they're quite, that calf is quite young, it's actually difficult to find the hornbud. Um, it can be very, very mature. And so um, two kind of um, age categories at the time of disbudding, uh, that sort of um, uh, two to four week period and also a slightly longer period, um, but less than two months of age. And the results showed that um, the dairy breed calves actually had a, a larger horn bud uh, than the beef breed calves. Um, within the beef breed calves, there was a slight sex difference. It was significant, but probably not clinically uh, significant. Uh, but in general, um, there wasn't a very good relationship uh, between age of, um, of calf and the size of the horn bud. Uh, and so particularly in the beef breeds, and that suggested that it would be um, uh, a little bit tricky to rely on waiting to a certain calf age and then bringing them all in and expecting that they're all still going to be small horn buds um, because of that great variability that we see between individuals. So to kind of draw conclusions, um, it is more important to disbud the dairy calves earlier than it is for the beef calves because they have larger horn bud sizes uh, at a given age. That's good because it is actually easier to disbud the dairy calves earlier. So that's the right way around. That's lucky. Um, but however, across the breeds and perhaps focusing on the beef breeds, calf age was not a good predictor of horn bud development. And therefore, the recommendation, particularly for those Irish beef farmers, is that careful attention should be paid to horn bud development such that calves are disbudded while horn bud development is still at that bud stage. And when the bud is, okay, large enough to be easily palpable or visible, but not so large that disbudding can lead to tissue trauma. I should also say that all the calves in the study, as is common practice these days, were disputed with appropriate um, analgesia and anesthesia. And then finally, another surgical husbandry practice, um, surgical castration. Now, where male calves are to be castrated for future beef production, um, in general, it's recommended that this is done earlier in life because there's less tissue trauma. Um, it can be, again, more challenging to castrate beef calves at a young age because they're not there with you. Um, and the legal requirements in both Australia and Ireland, where Gabby did the work, is that there's a six-month age limit requiring anaesthesia beyond this point, um, even though typically um, analgesia may be given before then. Now, in Ireland, um, typically they use a Burdizzo method of castration, which is where a clamp is replied for a number of seconds um, across the intact scrotal neck, but it effectively internally crushes the somatic cord and that separates the testis from its blood supply and the testis um, involutes or withers away. And so this study was to look at the effect of age of castration on stress indicators and growth of calves with a view to determining, you know, still within that six month limit, but even within there, is it better to try and castrate these animals earlier and make that recommendation to the farmers to try and bring the calves in and castrate them earlier if they're going to do it. So we can see that there are essentially uh, two age treatments, two and a half months of age and five months of age. 
And there was control cars, which were sham castrated. So they just kind of handled a bit and uh, the castrated animals. And the measurements included uh, blood chemistry, body weight change, uh, scrotal circumference is an indicator of scrotal swelling, and also a lot of animal behavior. And you can see that there are a lot of uh, postures, including uh, abnormal postures uh, that calves may exhibit if they're um, in discomfort as a result of uh, castration. And I'm going to just really quickly summarize the results. The results are essentially captured by this one slide. This shows time spent standing in an abnormal posture, bearing in mind that this was done by video. The video observer didn't know whether a calf had been castrated or sham castrated. And we can see here that um, castrated calves, particularly immediately after the procedure, spent more time in abnormal standing postures, but this was much more pronounced when they were castrated at five months of age compared with two and a half months of age. And so the conclusions from this study was that, yes, there's a degree of stress from castration, but it's much more pronounced in the older uh, calves. And this was also in the plasma cortisol response and also in terms of scrotal swelling. Uh, we didn't see changes in weight gain, inflammatory proteins or blood hematology, but certainly if castration is going to be done, it's better done earlier uh, as evidenced by this Bertizzo method here. And there's the published paper. So some overall conclusions from this work. I think the bobby calf work shows the importance of on-farm care and preparation of these calves before they leave the farm. That appeared to have the greatest effect on their welfare at the end of the supply chain. Um, the revised higher feeding recommendations that are now uh, promulgated in the Australian dairy industry for dairy calves benefit calf welfare as well as future production. And in terms of trying to maintain a degree of cow-calf togetherness, um, half-day separation may provide a practical option for extended cow-calf contact, but some issues need to be addressed. And then finally, notwithstanding the greater use of analgesia and anesthesia in performing these husbandry practices these days, performing them earlier in a calf's life or development um, reduces tissue trauma and improves calf welfare. And thank you to lots and lots of people, obviously. Um, this type of work is always collaborative. Um, I'm talking about it, but in some ways, you know, I'm, I feel like the imposter because many people have done it, including people who you know, undertook it as part of their PhDs and MPhils. So thank you to everyone and thank you to the funders. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share this work with you today. Andrew. Thank you so much for that really uh, interesting seminar and, and such important work because, of course, there are, I don't know how many millions of dairy calves there will be around the world. You might, you, you might know, but, you know, this is relevant to, to, to lots of them. I mean, how many in Australia alone? Uh, I think there are about three and a half million in Australia. Three and a half million just in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, we're open for questions. So please put your questions for Andrew in the Q&A and I'll come to them in turn. I've got a couple of questions, but I'll go to the Q&A first. And um, Olivia Artez, um, would you like to ask your question? If not, I can um, ask it for you. If you want to unmute your microphone, um, you should be able to ask your question. Um, Olivia, are you there? Maybe not. So um, I will uh, ask this question, Andrew, and you, I think you did touch on this and Olivia says this may be answered later, but does milk production decrease without cow-calf separation? Um, yeah. Um, so how much does it decrease if you don't separate them? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. It's actually quite hard to measure. Um, for various reasons. Firstly, it is thought that where a cow continues to have some contact with her calf, um, she retains a little bit of milk during milking for that calf. So the milk letdown is not as complete um, during milking. So one of the concerns about maintaining cow-calf contact is not so much that the calf is 
you know, super greedy because in a sense, you know, cows can uh, produce more milk if you feed them more. Um, and there is a theoretical maximum, but it, it's ma- mainly driven by nutrition. The concern is actually around the milk letdown process during milking and the, the, the response of the cow to actually retains the milk in the udder, um, uh, you know, for the calf, which is quite an interesting effect. So, so yeah, it's a hard thing to measure. Good question. And we don't actually have a, a, a true finger on it for that reason. It's fascinating that the, the cow can actually do that. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a conscious, it's an involuntary uh, mechanism. Uh, milk letdown is driven by oxytocin. And we know that uh, car, cows that are more relaxed in the dairy have better milk letdown. Um, but that it appears that cows that have a, you know, oxytocin is very much a social kind of influenced hormone. And uh, yes, um, cows that don't have contact with their calves are able to have a more oxytocin response in the dairy, whereas if they have an oxytocin response to their calf, the dairy appears to be somewhat second best in eliciting that response. Okay, really. Hmm. Okay, let's go a couple more questions. Let's go to Jeremy Scoot. Um, Jeremy, I guess your question is in relation to the um, issue around bobby calves um, and the fact that they're mostly male and disposed of early. Yeah, Jeremy, that's, you I'm just, I'm just wondering how far, A, how practical is sex semen? And it's getting more practical, I understand, but how far down the track are we in Australia to uh, to using sex semen in an attempt to reduce the number of um, um, male calves? Great question. So sex semen is, is reasonably used. Um, obviously, it's a bit more expensive and it has a slightly lower conception rate to, to AI than the non-sex semen. But people uh, use it um, a, a reasonable amount across their heifer heifers because um, uh, for various reasons, including easier, easier calving. Um, we're, we're probably a little way off it because of the, the cost and reduced conception issues. But the other challenge is that we will still then result in more calves than we need to have as replacement future cows. And so something will have to, have to happen to those female calves. Yeah. At the moment, surplus female calves in recent years have uh, gone on a boat to China or somewhere like that, which itself creates a welfare discussion. Mm-hmm. So. But it is felt that it still is preferable to try to, let's say, avoid having young calves go to the abattoir at five days of age and try to have a more productive life for them. And yeah. sex semen is probably part of that solution, not the whole solution, but probably part of it. Super. Thanks, Andrew. Jeremy, thanks for your question. Um, let's move on to Bill Malcolm. Um, Bill, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, um, Andrew, thanks. Great talk. Very interesting. Very early in the piece, you had a slide that I call it colostrum transfer, but you had a proper term for it. Some farmers did a terrific job and some did a terrible job. And what was the difference? Who? What did they, those who did it well, how did they do it well? Um, we don't know because this is simply based on the fact that uh, we could identify farms as being from the same calves as being from the same farm, we don't actually don't know what those farms were in order to go and interview the farmer, and there'd be actually privacy reasons around that. Um, but where people like Zoe Vogels and I think Ash Phipps have actually looked at practices on farm, it's really about just management quality and and how well people are motivated to do it. And bear in mind that bobby calves because the farmer knows or whoever's rearing the calves know that they're going to be leaving the farm at five days of age probably inevitably there's perhaps a little bit less motivation on the human side of things to make sure that colostrum management is optimal okay thank you mate um andrew i had a a question related to that maybe it's a good point for me to ask it now Um, but with my immunology hat on i was a bit surprised to see you talk about measuring whole um, protein in the in the plasma as a surrogate marker of um, transferred immunity. So I know that immunoglobulins go from the mother to the calf in the colostrum, but rather than measuring immunoglobulins in in the in the blood, you were measuring total protein. But isn't total protein mostly things like albumin and alpha two macroglobulin and all the other protein constituents in in plasma? 
Yes, so I apologise if I misspoke. It was actually total serum protein that was used, and it is a proxy indicator. But in a young calf, uh, total serum protein, the, the other things are reasonably constant, and what varies it is the degree of immunoglobulins, um, essentially most of which they've received via colostrum from the dam. No, you probably did say serum protein. I'd probably put in the plasma there, but but still, the the, the yeah, I see. Okay, so okay, all right, good. Let's move on. Um, Melina Tenson, would you like to ask your question? Melina, if you're just on mute, um, you can ask your question. Otherwise, I'll ask it for you. Okay, maybe I'll ask it. Um, and Melina's question, Andrew, is how far down the track? Oh, hello, go ahead. Hello, Melina. No, maybe not. So the question is, how far down the track is the Australian dairy industry in relation to introducing holdness? I'm not quite sure what's meant by that. It's oh, yeah, like okay. I'll, I'll, yeah I, can, I can answer and, and explain. So poldness is where the, uh, the semen that is used for AI uh, in the dairy industry is from bulls that carry the pole gene. Um, and very basically, the pole gene is dominant. Okay, yeah, so the pole will be... Yeah. Hey, still, I think you might have your microphone open still. Okay. Um, so the, 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 the polled allele is dominant. So that means that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that that's good in a way. But unfortunately, very few of the top dairy AI sires are naturally polled. And it's going to take a while to, to bring in that poll genetics, you know, into, into, the, into the dairy industry. And that's an international effect. So how far... How long is it? I, I think it's not very far along because of the challenges of that introduction process, um, but it's certainly very aware of it, as of what I would say. And that's an international awareness as well. Yeah. Andrew, we're nearly at time. Um, maybe I can ask one last question. And, um, and, and that is, um, what are the drivers for increasing the uh, welfare of uh, calves and cattle? It, is it public pressure, um, because public are very aware, and you were talking about the separation of calves, for example, uh, public are, are very aware, or is it just a small fraction a fraction of people that are um, particularly aware of these issues? Or is it that there's, um, there's incentives on the industry to do this, not just based on public awareness, but perhaps based on um, based on profits in the dairy industry? I mean, what are, the, what are the big drivers for increasing welfare? Or is it just, reg is it regulation? Um, uh, great question. I have to. I'll answer. Try and answer it really briefly. Regulation typically isn't a driver. Regulation is important, but it tends to provide a base underpinning and also is sort of a lagging thing. Often, it's mm. difficult to get new regulations in. Um, it really is driven by the industry being aware of its vulnerability if it's not seen to be addressing calf welfare adequately. Calves themselves, unless they're replacement heifers, are not super valuable. Bobby calves are not super valuable. Um, it, it really is about uh, the industry wanting to uh, not be exposed on the issue and be seen to be um, improving and you know, incrementally, continually improving on the issue. Uh, and I, I think that's what's driving it. I think the majority of the public probably aren't super aware of calf welfare on a daily basis, but if they were made aware or presented with something that looked bad, I think they'd be fairly upset about it. So I think that's what helps drive it as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Andrew, I think we'll close there. Um, thank you for the answer to that last question. I really enjoyed uh, that talk. I, I learned quite a lot and I thought you pitched it at just the right level for the audience. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who was in the audience today for taking the time to attend today's presentation. And I hope you can join us next time, which will be on the 9th of November um, for the next Dean's Research Seminar, which will be on strain identification of avian pathogens. And it'll be presented by Professor Amir Hajj Noor Mohammadi. So um, I'll see you all then, I hope. Uh, in the meantime, um, go well and uh, uh, have a good day. Have a good week. Thank you. Bye-bye.